What is going on everybody, welcome back to the J Area Podcast, my name is Jose Ramos Jr., but you guys already knew that, and we are fresh off of the heels of a historic WrestleMania 40 event, for more on that, obviously I covered that on Monday's video, describing how Cody finally finished his story, and the fallout that was the Bloodline Saga, as well as the Rhodes story being told. With WrestleMania 40 now in the rear view mirror, we look forward to the next year that WWE will produce, and One thing that was very apparent throughout the course of this entire week was Triple H and the WWE were hell-bent on pushing the agenda that this is a new era. Now, whether or not we have established what the name of that new era will be, I think it's safe to say that there's been many changes, not only storylines, not only the way that the shows are produced, but just the overall mentality and the, the vibe that this company has really gone through over the course of these last two years. Now, there has been some names thrown out there, like the Paul Levesque era, the Triple H era. I personally am of the the subscribing of the Renaissance era. I think it's a really cool name. But ultimately, we don't really get to name the era until it's over with. That's what happened with the Attitude Era. The Golden Era, the Ruthless Aggression Era, the PG Era, the Reality Era. And now that we are hitting this new era with champions galore. You look at WrestleMania 40, new champions in almost every category. We have a new Universal Champion in Cody Rhodes. A new World Heavyweight Champion in Damian Priest. A new Women's Champion in Bayley. Two sets of Tag Team Champions with Austin Theory and Grayson Waller for the SmackDown titles, and the Raw titles having the awesome truth. Also, I would be remiss to mention Sami Zayn, who won the Intercontinental Championship, defeating Gunther. A lot of change. And for those that have followed the product for the last couple decades, it's very apparent. You can see the changes that are being made, not only on screen, but behind the scenes as well. The power dynamic that was known as the Vince McMahon hierarchy has now shifted to a much more locker room friendly environment. And I think that's a testament to Triple H and his leadership. Triple H, who has been with the company for 30 plus years, he knows what it's like to join the company as a fresh face, having to establish your name, having to establish your character, built up that respect, built up that equity that ended up becoming the game Triple H. And then as he would transition himself into a more office position, ultimately becoming COO and then the chief of content officer, over the course of that time, he paid his dues. He knows what it's like to be in the position that many of these wrestlers are. So I feel like the way he runs the show now is how a wrestler would want it to be ran. Now, Vince McMahon understood the business, and we have to give him his credit for being the one who helped showcase WrestleMania, showcase sports entertainment, and attract a wide audience that allowed it to grow into the company and to the sport that it is to this day. But over the course of those last few decades and last few years, you can you can sense that he was starting to fall off. He was losing touch, which is not abnormal for a, a man of his age. You start to lose touch in what the audience likes as well as what makes sense. And when you've done it for so long, you kind of become more complicit and complacent, I should say. Whereas you go through the motions, you know what will get you certain numbers and certain viewerships and the money aspect of it. I know there was a, a big interview towards the end of 2020 and 2021, where there was a point where WWE was going to make money in spite of itself. No matter how good of a product that they presented, they were still going to produce money. Now, Triple H, having stepped in as basically the new head of creative, the new head of talent relations, he understands what has worked and what has not worked. He's seen firsthand the highest of highs with the Attitude Era. But he was also there of the lowest of the lows during the new generation era when WCW was beating them in the ratings seemingly every week. He's someone who's been there in the trenches. And he, along with Shawn Michaels, who helps run the developmental brand NXT, those two men have 
altered the face of WWE for the better. And I think it's very ironic that you go back into the 90s when Triple H and Shawn Michaels were members of DX and harassing Vince McMahon and, and causing all this mayhem and trouble. Now, ultimately, they're running the show. They're running the company. And it's working. The numbers are proving it. Viewership is at a great at a great high for you know the for the climate of cable television and streaming that it is. Merchandising, the fan reception, everything is going right for the WWE. And what's what's really a welcoming sight is at least for the time being, gone are the days where the WWE would punish you for being fans of a certain superstar. Instead they embrace it. We become fans of Sami Zayn, Intercontinental Champion. We fall in love with the story that Cody Rhodes has been telling, Universal Champion. We get behind Bailey, who wants to get back at Damage Control, Women's Champion. Our truth and his comedic timing, Tag Team Champion. We are being rewarded for keeping up with the product. And following these stories and following these matches and becoming invested in, and it's not just a waste of time. Whereas if you were to follow the product 10 years ago and a certain individual lacked interest in a wrestler or a storyline, it would get dropped. That's not the case anymore. And I thought it was a very important episode of Monday Night Raw, the Raw after Mania, of course. It would help dictate what the company would look like moving forward. Obviously, WrestleMania 40 was a tremendous success. Matches upon matches, moments upon moments that will stick with us for the rest of time. But the Raw After Mania essentially shows you what the next calendar year could look like. And you look at the opening of Monday Night Raw. Cody Rhodes comes out after being introduced by Triple H who welcomes the Philadelphia audience and again introduces this new era that we are being shown by the WWE. Cody Rhodes comes out, universal title and all, and it's beginning to grow on me. I do hope he fulfills that request that he mentioned about bringing the Winged Eagle title back. But the current title, look, has been around for a year now. And it's grown on me. It looks good on Cody. But I digress. So he talks about winning the WWE Universal Championship and what it means to him to be the face of this new This new era. This new movement. But he's ultimately interrupted by The Rock. And The Rock, let me tell you, had a tremendous amount of heat in Philadelphia to the point where they would not let him speak until minutes in to the promo. They were chanting expletives towards his way. And The Rock visibly was having a great time kind of antagonizing this crowd. But he comes up to Cody Rhodes and he congratulates him. Congratulations on finishing your story and winning the WWE title. But he begins having this this sense of arrogance, almost toying with Cody. He, The Rock, has his people's title, the people's championship, as the family of Muhammad Ali would bestow upon him this last weekend at the Hall of Fame. But he's looking at Cody Rhodes' title, and he says, can I hold that? And just like an old schoolyard bully, he goads him into giving him that title. But Cody, obviously the intelligent baby face that he is, which is a welcoming sight because, again, if you look 10 years ago, they treated their baby faces like idiots. But not this one. Cody says, yeah, I'll let you hold it, but let me hold yours. Planting the seeds for a future matchup between the two. Because The Rock says, hey, congratulations on finishing your story with Roman Reigns. But going forward, our story is just starting. That leaves room for a a third matchup between Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes. Also opening the door to The Rock and Cody Rhodes. And obviously in the background, we all know that the original plan was The Rock versus Roman Reigns. That is three huge main events still on the table. No pun intended. Now, when they decide to pull the trigger on these matches has yet to be seen. I personally, I believe SummerSlam is where you can cash in on one of these. Now, whether it's 
Cody versus Roman Part 3, or The Rock versus Cody. But regardless, whenever Cody versus Rock happens, I think the natural progression would be that is when they pull the trigger on Roman Reigns versus Seth Rollins. Because one thing I didn't mention on Monday's video was the importance of Seth Rollins at WrestleMania 40. I saw somewhere on the internet, Seth Rollins could be considered the MVP of WrestleMania 40 because of his contributions, because of the sacrifices that he made at this event. You look at the tag team match, him and Cody Rhodes versus The Rock and Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins did not have to participate in that match, but he told Cody Rhodes, I will be there for you, I will be your shield. Ultimately, they would lose the match. And the next night, after sustaining a knee injury, of course, kayfabe was, going to war with the bloodline, he had to face a hungry, obsessed Drew McIntyre for the World Heavyweight Championship. And ultimately, he would come up short. He would lose a visibly upset Seth Rollins, who was emotional throughout the course of night two in WrestleMania. He told Drew McIntyre, you earned it. Obviously, that would lead to the cash-in, but we'll get to that in a moment. Seth Rollins loses the World Heavyweight title. But that wasn't the end of his night, because in the main event, Bloodline rules. In the midst of all the chaos that was the Jimmy and Jay altercation, John Cena and The Rock entering the ring, a familiar song would ring out saying Sierra Hotel India Echo, Lima, Delta, Shield. And for a moment, wrestling fans all across the globe had to take a pause, myself included, because we were immediately thinking Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose, but John Moxley, obviously still under contract with All Elite Wrestling. And Seth Rollins, donning the gear that the Shield wore for years on end, enters the ring and is quickly disposed of by the tribal chief Roman Reigns. But during the breakdown of the match, Roman has the steel chair in hand. And he has he's faced with a choice. Cody Rhodes, the man who is challenging for his universal title, who's been a pain in his neck for the last couple of years. Or Seth Rollins, the man that betrayed him ten years prior who is still lingering in the back of Roman Reigns' mind. He's never gotten over the breakup of the shield. Seth Rollins essentially broke up the bond between brothers. And Roman Reigns never forgot about that. And in that moment, he took the opportunity to give him that receipt. He took his eye off the ball. His obsession with Seth Rollins and the shield breakup was his undoing. In essence, Seth Rollins bit the bullet for Cody Rhodes. He indeed was the shield for Cody. And seeing what he was able to do to Seth Rollins, Roman Reigns took that opportunity, took his eye off the ball, giving Cody just enough time to recuperate, countering a spear, hitting three crossroads for the 1-2-3 new. Universal Champion. Seth Rollins and his contributions to this WrestleMania should not go unnoticed. And although we did not see him this past week on Monday Night Raw, I have a feeling we won't be seeing him for quite some time. I think he's earned that much. He held the World Heavyweight title for 316 days, establishing a, a sense of honor and prestige to that world title because he defended it nearly week in and week out. Against the likes of Jay Uso, Drew McIntyre, Sami Zayn, among others. So we won't be seeing Seth Rollins for a while. But another segment in the match, or excuse me, in the episode of Monday Night Raw, that really got my attention was the ending. Drew McIntyre, obviously there was a four, fatal four-way match to declare who would be the number one contender for the World Heavyweight title? Drew McIntyre had it won. But the man that cost him 
his world title the night prior was the very same man who would cost him the fatal four-way, that man being CM Punk. Now, this feud has been red hot for a couple months now. I cannot wait for this match to happen. All the Again, all the equity being built up in this feud between Seth, excuse me, between Punk and Drew McIntyre. It's tremendous. You go back to WrestleMania 40, obviously Drew, Mac- Drew McIntyre wins the world title, and he spots CM Punk at the commentary table, and he takes that opportunity to gloat, to show him, hey, I have what you were penciled in to have. This was supposed to be you, but it's not. And in that moment, again, Drew, obsessed with CM Punk, met his undoing, as CM Punk would ultimately lead to an attack on Drew McIntyre, thus opening the door for an attack by Damian Priest. And Damian Priest, Mr. Money in the Bank, cashes in at WrestleMania, defeating Drew McIntyre, becoming your new World Heavyweight Championship. And that in itself is very interesting because it opens up the possibilities to new feuds. Jey Uso would ultimately win that Fatal 4-Way matchup and become the number one contender for the World Heavyweight title. It's something fresh. It's something new. Over the past few years, we keep seeing the same main eventers. Seth Rollins, Cody Rhodes, Roman Reigns, Jey Uso and Damian Priest, if you would have told me two years ago that that would be your feud for a world title matchup, I would think, what the hell happened? Where is everybody? But it's a feud now that I'm invested in, one because of how they built up Jey Uso, as well as the presentation of Damian Priest on Judgment Day and on Monday Night Raw. The look. A new theme song. If you had any thought, As to how he would be presented as a world champion. Those thoughts are clear now. I have no doubt in my mind. I have all the trust in the world in what they're doing with Damian Priest. I'm looking forward to it. Because now you get to tell the story with Jey Uso. Early on in 2024, he said, I will leave this year having won singles gold. Obviously, he wasn't able to do that with the Intercontinental title because of his brother Jimmy. But now we have a world title in mind. Can you imagine Jey Uso as the world heavyweight champion? Something to behold, but we haven't gotten there yet. Monday Night Raw was a huge, monumental Monday Night Raw. Because we also got a little flavor of NXT. We had a surprise matchup between Shinsuke Nakamura, former NXT champion, Taking on the current NXT champion, Ilya Dragunov, in what was a hard-hitting but fun matchup that showcased the abilities of an Ilya Dragunov. And in years past, these NXT call-ups was really an opportunity to have them you know, earn their way, earn their keep. But they showcased Ilya Dragunov, and he fit right in. No vignette, no promo, no package, but the fans cheered him they were invested in him they knew who he was which is very important especially coming out of nxt because if they don't know who you are how are we going to get invested in you and he wasn't the only nxt superstar to arrive on monday night raw because the women's champion roxanne perez also made an appearance as well and then we get the news that nxt will be a part of this year's wwe draft at the end of the month here in april April 26th and April 29th on an episode of SmackDown and Raw, the the draft will take place. We'll see the WWE shake up again. I'm curious to see how it happens, whether it's going to be like the superstar shake up that we're used to and it's just random superstars appearing on different shows or will they have like a sit down um, where they're able to select, hey, I want this guy, you want this guy and they'll go name by name. Very similar to how they did last year. I think it's always fun to have a draft. It's just going to be interesting, like I said. Is it going to be open to the entire roster? Are we going to have a you know, selective pool that we're going to choose from? How are they going to do it? They can't do anything wrong at this moment. And that's part of the reason why it's reinvigorated my love for professional wrestling. I've been watching this since the year 2000 when I was two years old. 
I am now about to reach 26 years of age. So being able to say that I've seen this sport grow for the past 24 years into what it has become, it's always been there. But now because it's been so hot and it's at this peak where ESPN, Bleacher Report, Fox, you name it, all news outlets are reporting on what's going on in the daily occurrence that is the WWE. It's firing on all cylinders. It has never been, or I shouldn't say it's never been, it's been a long time that pro wrestling fans have had so many options and have so much to look forward to. The WWE, as I mentioned, is on fire. But the same cannot be said for its leading competitor, All Elite Wrestling. And I know primarily on this channel and on this YouTube channel and on the podcast, I I cover more so of the WWE because I've been watching it for my whole life, as I mentioned. But I've also kept up with All Elite Wrestling, one, because it has a lot of superstars that I enjoy watching. Guys like Kenny Omega, The Young Bucks, you have Hangman Adam Page, Kazuchika Okada... So many names I I don't have the time right now to name. And I want them to succeed. Because I've always believed that competition is key. You need to have someone to help push you to your limits in order to improve. That's what WCW did for the WWF back in the day. And I would like to think that AEW and its inception and its early success is what kind of forced the WWE to reevaluate. Take a moment, step back, and see what is it that we're doing that could be better. In the headlines, of course, right now, All Elite Wrestling is running a storyline. I mean, I don't know if you would call it a storyline, but it was announced on tonight's Wednesday Dynamite. They were going to air the the footage of the events of last year's All In. Now, many people would assume that this is in retaliation to the interview that CM Punk gave with Ariel Hawani on the MMA Hour and how he expressed what occurred at All In with his altercation with Jack Perry, also known as Jungle Boy. And Tony Khan, for all his faults and all his successes, is deeming it okay to readdress This incident. Now, he has, of course, the company hasn't really outright said we're going to be showing CM Punk, but they're alluding to that event that took place. Whether or not it is the actual footage or if it's some kind of kayfabe explanation has yet to be seen, we'd have to wait till Dynamite to see. I personally, I'm going to look into it in the sense. That it's actually going to be the the footage of Punk and Perry's altercation. It'll be an excellent opportunity to get a quick rating. Because I know for me personally, as a CM Punk fan, and just as a fan of controversy within professional wrestling, I'll be checking it out. No doubt about it. Anytime you can get some kind of dirt from behind the scenes, count me in. It's all about that inside baseball. You want to know what's going behind the scenes. But long term, what does that do? How are they going to benefit this? I'm curious. If it's in a way that they can present Jack Perry in a positive light and they can push him because right now he's in Japan being pushed as the scapegoat is what his gimmick is looking like. Is this an opportunity to bring him back into AEW and push him further? Like I said, it's yet to be seen. But I just don't know if it's a smart route to take. Of course, it's not my company. That's important to remember. Essentially, it is Tony Khan's company, so he can run it however he chooses. But again, I try to look at it from a logical point of view. I would much rather hope that he's operating in the sense of a business rather than thinking about his emotions. Obviously, what CM Punk said wasn't very flattering, calling Tony Khan a plain clown. And that he isn't running a business. And that's why CM Punk has got a lot of, you know, flack. And is surrounded by controversy because he'll say things that people really shouldn't be saying. And I feel like that's also what endears him to the audience. He says things that we wish we could say about our boss or or whatever the case may be or whoever's relationship that you're involved with. 
So I'm very interested to see how they move forward with that, especially with their next pay-per-view, AEW Dynasty, just around the corner. AEW's in this lull right now where they have the opportunity to build upon an incredible roster. And they really should focus more so on being the alternative that they set out to be rather than trying to, I mean, for a lack of a better term, mooch off of talent that isn't even with them anymore. CM Punk is not going back to AEW. There is no way he'll go go back given this, especially with reports saying that their goal is to embarrass him. I know it's a lot to take in, but I mean, that's why we got to check out Dynamite. I wish AEW the best. I really do. I keep up with the product. I will say I'm not as invested in it as the WWE, just because of the consistency that they've been rolling with. But I love to give them an opportunity to continue furthering their business, better or worse, whatever you know choices they decide. But having alternative companies to go to, different products to watch, it just makes pro, pro wrestling so much more enjoyable, is what I mean. Because for the longest time, WWE was the only game in town. But now it's like you have AEW, you have TNA, New Japan. Ring of Honor still falls in line with AEW, but you still have that as well. And there are numerous of other companies that I haven't mentioned. But it's just because WWE right now has all the momentum. These guys can't miss. I lost track already on how many times they've sold out a TV arena. Last time I checked, I think it was 15. That's ridiculous. Ultimately, it will have to end. But when it gets to the point where episodes of Monday Night Raw and SmackDown, they have to alter the entranceway to fit more people, to accommodate the seating. I never get tired of saying this, but it is the hottest it has been in the last 24 years. And it's only going to get bigger. We're building towards Backlash, which is taking place in Paris, France. They're global. They're more global than they've ever been. It truly is the dawning of a new era. Like I mentioned, we may not know what the era is, but it's so clear that it's the, the potential is there. There's so much more to accomplish, not only in terms of match quality, but of business. They just hired and signed Julia, who was at NXT Stand and Deliver, what we haven't even talked about. Stand and Deliver was a success already in itself. It was one of the biggest, if not the biggest, NXT show of all time. Main, you know, main evented by Trick Williams and Carmelo Hayes in what has been the premier storyline in NXT over the course of the last year. Obviously, you had Tony D'Angelo falling to Ilya Dragunov. As I mentioned, Roxanne Perez emerges as the new women's champion. The tag team title scene is is interesting, given that Baron Corbin and Braun Breaker are the current tag titles. But NXT, again, entertaining. So many names, so many characters. And it's only going to get better. As we continue moving on into this new era, I look forward to it. I keep up with every episode of NXT, every episode of Monday Night Raw, Friday Night SmackDown. I'm trying to keep up with AEW. Dynamite is something I always watch. Collision, I watch. Rampage is the one that kind of slips through the cracks. It's just so much content to keep up with. But we do our best to keep up with it and update the viewers. And ever since transitioning on YouTube, covering more of the pro wrestling content, a lot of growth has been shown. Obviously, the goal is still to get to 1,000 subscribers. We recently just hit the milestone of 200 subscribers, so I appreciate you guys and the love and support. Continue to like and share. Find other people to help subscribe to the channel as we grow it into something bigger and better. But the goal is 1,000 subscribers, hopefully by the end of the year. We're on a really good pace, and it would not be possible without, again, the love and support and the dedication that you guys are providing to not only the podcast, but to the videos that I'm producing on YouTube. Pro Wrestling's back. And you can definitely expect me to be covering it now more than ever, whether it is behind the scenes, more so we'll covering the, the ongoings on television. I'll be sharing my reviews and my opinions on what's going on, as well as what are some of my favorite ongoing events 
in the world of professional wrestling. But with that being said, thank you again for listening to the J Area Podcast. My name has always been Jose Ramos Jr. And we will see you guys on the next episode.